We should have done that with you. Whatever we shouldn't have done that with it, Father, forgive us. Father, forgive us, O God. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 66, verse 4, it says, All earth should worship God and sing praises to him. For all he has done, he says that they sing praises to his name all the time. So the Bible says, wherever two or three have gathered, there he is in their midst. We have gathered in the airwaves, but we believe that the Lord is here. And therefore, we are going to give him our worship tonight. We are going to worship him in a way that you have not even worshipped him. It doesn't matter where you are, but the Bible says we should give him praise at all times. Therefore, we are begin to worship God, begin to say good things, worthy things to him before he accepts. Worship your word says we should come and give you all the glory. We are you are kind. We sing praise to your name because you are good and you are God. You are the mighty God. You are the Lord. This evening we will worship you. This evening we will worship you because you are good. You are the Lord. Father, we lift up our hands before the day to you, Lord. Honor and praise because you deserve it. You have been good to us, Your mercies, your love, your grace has been so great. This evening, we bless you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the adoration. Oh, no, Oh, I'm 
Father, this evening we want to bless your name. Yes, we want to give you all the glory because you are God and you are good. Amen. You are kind and your mercy endures forever. You are worthy of our praise because you have called us your children. You are the God who has both. Father, we that this evening, even as we have gathered, come and take your place. Come and speak to us. Amen. Come and teach us. Amen. Speak to every heart yes, so that at the end of the day we will say thank you. Amen. We will give you all the praise Amen. for all you have done for us. Amen. We commit the speaker into your hands yes, and we pray that you will speak through him. Yes, Lord. Let the Holy Spirit take charge tonight Amen. so that at the end of the day we will say it was good to have come to your presence. We thank you and bless you. you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie Ruby, for leading us this evening. We are so grateful to you. We are so, so grateful to God for yet another day. We are continuing with um, marriage and family life week. But before the speaker comes in, I want you to join me to sing the song. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. If you can sing it, join me. Oh, wondrous, and Oh, 
Chrysler to show a short video on the profile of our speaker, who is no other person than who spoke to us yesterday, powerfully yesterday, Elder Kevin Anand. So Chrysler, video. It's actually entered into by two selfish individuals who must learn to be selfless, otherwise the marriage won't work. Our speaker for today is a licensed youth minister, certified life coach, and healthy homes advocate. Don't take God out of your life. Keep God at the center, so that anybody who wants to marry you in the future, they must love God. Elder Amos Kevin Allen has served as the deputy youth director of the Church of Pentecost and as a counselor at the Pentecost University with a broad experience of addressing different categories of people on matters of love and family life. My body is not anybody's playground. Some boys want an amusement park and they think a certain girl's body is a place to go and have fun. He has ministered in every major denomination during youth camps, singles events, couples clubs, church services and many more. Elder Amos is a compassionate, passionate and respected voice on relational matters. He has served as a resource person on numerous English and local language radio and TV programs for three decades. He is a convener and host of the following programs. Creative Couples Conclave, Females in Fellowship Hangouts, Mobilizing Meals Initiatives, and Singles in 3D Summits. He's also the author of Becoming a Beauty for His Glory, Matters of the Heart, Doing Dating Decently, and Unwrapping Being and Married. He's happily married to Mrs. Evelyn Kevin Annan and has been blessed with two daughters, Timothy Generation. With a resounding applause, let us welcome our guest speaker, Elder Amos Kevin Annan. So, Elder. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you very much, uh, PIWC Accra. I think you are the bonifiedism. <laughs> yeah. of the of the PIWC brand and uh, we want to thank our Sofo Ade and his dear wife Meg um, they've been very good friends for many 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 years and uh, I am no stranger to Kokumlimli family and uh, I'm delighted to be joining you once again this evening and I thank God for the opportunity offered me to share God's word regarding this critical issue of family life. And so I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, as we promised yesterday, that if Jesus tires, we will continue. Here we are today um, on day two of our conversations. And um, as we know, we're going to be focusing on a very crucial part of the matter of family life. And so I would point you again back to my YouTube. You could go there and get some resources for yourself, uh, for your family, uh, where it is that we are not able to address all the issues that pertain to the subject under consideration. I see a lot of very wonderful brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles who have also joined in this conversation who may not necessarily be part of uh, PIWC Accra. So this is my upcoming book. Um, it's delayed in release, but we would ask you to continue to pray with us. Uh, hopefully, um, we, our target was to release it this June, uh, but it was not to be. Hopefully, we will work things out and it will come. Now, as an individual, uh, there are three things that really informs the things I do. And these are my motivation. First, I learned to lead myself. I mean, it's important to take leadership responsibility and ownership for your actions, decisions, choices that you make in this life. The second thing is follow Christ Jesus. So the model that Jesus sets for me is, is importance, is of utmost importance. And the third critical thing that informs everything I do under the sun 
is got to do with serving others. And these are very important because everybody must be motivated by something. And some are motivated by money, some are motivated by fame, some are motivated by the power it offers them. But these three are the things that drive my heart and I hold them so dearly. So tonight, I want to share some of the resources that have blessed me over the period. There are quite a number of them, but I can't share all of them in this short time because that will even take the entire presentation time. Now, there are four books here that have really been a blessing to me, and I believe you would also be blessed. The first one is Effective Parenting in a Defective World by Chip Ingram. The second one is Raising Wise Children, Handing Down the Story of Wisdom. And it's a very beautiful book. I like the way Mark Matlock wrote this particular book and uh, the kind of style he used was very, very, very refreshing away from the many ones that I knew. Now, the next one is Preparing Your Son for Every Man's Battle. Then followed by, that's by Steve Atterban and Fred uh, Storka uh, with Mike Yoki. Then also Shannon Etheridge and Steve Atterban again together came up with this, um, preparing your daughter for every woman's battle. The collections from Dr. Dobson, I mean, his age old Dr. Dobson, uh, focus on the family fame, uh, Dr. Dobson has these four collections I would recommend. In fact, the third one is actually a collection of three. Um, bringing up girls, bringing up boys. Then he has what he calls the parenting collection. In the parenting collection, you have the new dare to discipline and then the new um, strong-willed child. But then there is this other one. Parenting isn't for cowards. Just the title alone got me petrified, and it's what led me to pick the book in the first place. Of course, the author is somebody I admire greatly. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a physician and an astute Christian apologist. I mean, he defends the Christian faith to the max, and I have admired his courage, his you know, confidence uh, in, in this matters, and particularly when it comes to young people and their formation and nurturing. Now, these are resources. You can get them at Challenge Bookshop. It's very close to your church. And uh, please just walk in there. Uh, go to the family side of things and uh, pick any of these books from there. Um, I have these two resources that I believe are, will be helpful for those of you, particularly working with teenagers, interacting with teenagers. The first one is understanding the needs of teenagers. And the second is working with teenagers. Uh, the young people are changing in very rapid fashion, but the principles of God and the girding, their nurturing and formation have not changed. We just have to customize it in response to the situations that they find themselves. So tonight we are looking at the perils of parenting today. And for our focus, we're looking at our We'll come to the starter, we'll state the problem of parenting today. We'll look at the pangs and perils of parenting. We'll look at the power and place of peerless parents. It's so important we get a peerless parent. You know, a parent who does not compare nor contrast themselves with others, but may be inspired by others. And they uniquely respond to the challenge and the call to be a parent in a way that is peerless. And that's, that's what I advocate for by the grace of God. Then also preparing to be a peerless parent. Then the price, the price and the prize of peerless parenting. And so we will move to uh, my preliminary positions. It's like getting a starter of a meal. You go for a meal and you get a starter. People take all kinds of things for starters. Of course, um, I'm an advocate of lean stuff, and so I won't choose fatty stuff necessarily. But my first position is this, that there's no perfect parent. The reason is that there are no perfect human beings. All of us are striving 
and strenuously stretching our muscles to be perfect. We want to be like Christ. That's why in the Church of Pentecost, there's this beautiful song. Samri, ori siye siye yen. Samri, ori na sempano yen ye kra ye beseno. Se yesu kristo nyami ba no ba yeni no bese. We shall be like him when he appears in glory. And basically, that's that, that which is imperfect will give away for that which is perfect to come. And the Apostle Paul rightly said, now we see in part and we know in part. And when that which is the glorious Christ appears, we shall give away all the imperfections and the things that we know in part. And so it's important to come to that point of recognizing that there are no perfect parents. The second preliminary position I'll make is that parenting can be painful. You know, last year, one of the things I did was to look at good parents in the Bible who had bad children, and there's so many of them. And I also looked at good children who were the offsprings of very bad parents. In fact, the Bible uses a certain line, he did evil in the sight of God. That's the benchmark for bad parenting. If you do evil in the sight of God, it's not about any other thing. It's about doing right in the eyes of God, contrasted with doing evil in the sight of the Lord. One of my favorite mentors, uh, Dr. Billy Graham, he professed to be called Billy Graham simply uh, when he was alive. Uh, he says, I believe the home and marriage is the foundation of our society and must be protected. At the heart of the peril of parenting, yesterday we talked about spouses first, parents second. And this is something every Christian couple should not joke with. Your marriage supports your parenting endeavors, but your parenting cannot support your marriage. That is why it's important to give attention to the quality of marriage, the state of the union. Because the state of the union has a direct reflection in our parenting. I've been watching our two daughters and I see that sometimes they role play some of our anger expressions as a couple. How Amos gets angry, I see one of them show it. How Evelyn gets angry and her actions and responses towards me, I see the other also do it. And that's, that's really, really at the heart of parenting that there will be our offspring or progenies modeling after us. And so the bile in us, they must not see. The negative things, they must not even notice, let alone make it their own. And that's what we all pray as parents. Now, there is no magic wand to wave when it comes to parenting. Neither is there any pill that is called parenting miracle pill. I haven't seen one. I haven't seen one. And it's at the heart of the pearls of parenting because it is something we know faintly about. But when we enter, it is there and then that we begin to appreciate the real nuances of parenting. And so there's no pill that I can offer you tonight that was a bingo, you're going to be a good parent. No, I would be elusive. I'll be deceptive. I will not be honest with scripture. Now let's look at Luke chapter 15, verse 17 to 19. Luke 15, 17 to 19. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers, of my fathers have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of your hired, thy hired servants. Now the full story can be read in chapter, chapter 15, verse 11 to 32. But you see, this is the famous story of the prodigal son, as has been described. 
we've always, as human beings, looked at things from the negative perspective, and that's not uncommon. I have wondered why the story was not Christian, the forgiving father. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, we tend to call it the prodigal son. Well, that's fine. Uh, verse 20b and to 21 says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. An embrace of welcome, an affirmation of acceptance, a sense of belonging, a real assurance of forgiveness. This is a son who had become negligent because he was entrusted with resources that should have been his many years to come, but took it prematurely and went into what the Bible describes as wanton wastage or wanton dissipation. And that wastage ended him with persons who are going nowhere in life. I put myself in the father's place and I asked myself, if I were the father, would I be able to do what the man did? I don't know about you. I will struggle to even do half of what he did, honestly. For your son to take that which he's entitled in the future, now, only to go and waste it and come back. And that is why you look at the older sibling's protestation. He said, this son of yours went, wasted everything, and he's back. And the father called for a party to be thrown for the son. And I pray that we see the father heart of God in this, which is actually the foundation of parenting heart. And may God give us that grace because even good parents experience heartaches. And if you're a good parent and you're experiencing heartaches, your children are acting in ways and becoming of the name they bear. May God give you grace in these times. Because just like good things happen to bad people, bad things I've seen happen to good people. In much the same way, good parents have seen some of their children becoming bad. And I talked about bad. Bad is when they do evil in the sight of God. When they do things that could be described as, could make them get the description like, was said of the children of the high priest, the priest himself, that they were children of Belial, the devil's children. Good parents experience heartaches sometimes. Now, the problem of parenting today has to do with the control of children, children responding positively to our leadership, our direction, not questioning our authority. And that problem is at the heart of we nurturing them, knowing very well that we have a responsibility to God and to them and to society. And when you look at the pictures on the screen, you see how the children all look apprehensive to parental rebuke or correction or amendment or behavior. And it is something we encounter in our homes from time to time. I read a story of this gentleman somewhere last year, just before Father's Day. I don't know him from anywhere. But this is a man who said that he didn't get paternal input in his life. And he's a divorcee, raising his daughter all alone. And one of the things I read about him, he became the cover story of Meryl in 2021, just before Father's Day, the weekend of prior to Father's Day. That's the Saturday before the Sunday. And he said something that really struck me, that he wants to be a hands-on dad so that the child that he has would experience the things he did not get. And so when you look at the things he does for his daughter, he's all over the place doing all sorts of things with the, with the daughter. 
and there are many of us who may have experienced very painful parental stories. And some don't have pleasant memories of their parents. But you see, if you didn't get good parents, it does not mean you should be a bad parent. Because a lot of our young people today are burdened with pain. They're struggling with pain. And that pain, oftentimes, it is connected to activities from the home. This is a girl who is mourning the brutal killing of a loved one during the marathon. This marathon bombing in the United States, you know. And there's a young boy who has lost his father in the military, the US Army. And they have a tradition where they give the flag, they fold the flag and give to your child. It, it doesn't matter their age, they'll get the child to come. And there are a lot of children, both boys and girls, who are reeling under the weight of pain. And sometimes parents don't even see it. The pain may be within the domestic setting, may be within the learning environment, it may even be within church setting. I pray that God give us the eyes to see. Now, a lot of our young boys and girls are getting coached by people or parents. Look at the instruction his friend is giving him. Watch how his friend is going to respond to his parenting intervention. Watch him. You see how he begins by giving him instructions and he expected him to actually carry out the instructions without fault. We as parents, this is a big problem for parents. Where it is that there are people who are not parents, who are giving our children instructions that they carry out and execute same without fail. Now, many of this is found through the screens and comes with sentiments. And our young people are such that once their sentiments is captured, they become literally slaves to whatever it is. Now, pornophenomenon.com did a study on porn and its usage amongst young people and discovered that more than one quarter, that's 27% of the people they are sampled of young adults aged between 25 to 30, first viewed pornography before puberty. And having served as deputy director and worked with young people for the past three decades or more, I have seen and heard and read about young people who fit into this data. And the screen is becoming a very powerful place for nurturing. And this is happening on the blind side of parents and it's a problem for parenting. And parents need to pay attention to what their sons and daughters are doing on the screen. Now, a teacher goes to school and asks the children to write what they want to be. And one child's essay struck the teacher.
Now, this is a teacher who goes to school and asks the children to write about their wish. And it turns out that the teacher had her son in the class and the son was wishing to be a smartphone. Put yourself in the shoe of this teacher and the husband subsequently, who asked who wrote this piece and was told that our son wrote that piece. It is my prayer that those of us here as parents, one problem that young people are facing today is they are not getting eye contact from their parents because the screens have taken the eye contact from them. I remember in my first time as deputy, one young girl, 16, said to me, they have taken away my father and giving me an apostle. I remember when I shared it at the pastors and wives conference in that year, a lot of people were broken because she has lost a father and in place of the father, she had an apostle. For a 16 year old girl to process this and come to such a conclusion could be fatal for them. Now let's look at the punks and perils of parenting. Punks basically are sharp, sudden pain that comes. Perils are dangers that we are confronted with. And parenting faces both sudden shocks and unintended occurrences, unimagined, and sometimes we are ill-prepared for such occurrences. And these pangs of pain can be really, really painful for parents. In 2012, the then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, David Cameron and his wife, Samantha, had gone to a restaurant from Downing Street to go and eat a meal as a family. When they had finished eating, they both assumed that their little daughter, whose face is screened, Nancy, was with them. So they all drove off on the basis of their assumption. Only for them to arrive at their respective destination to realize that Nancy was with neither of them. She had been left in the restaurant. And from the story, David quickly decided to drive back to the restaurant. And when he got there, Nancy was in the kitchen with the chef, very common with children. And Jesus did likewise. When they had gone for worshiping as a family, he disappeared and he was found in the temple arguing and reasoning from scriptures, the scrolls from the scrolls with the scholars of his day. What does it connote? It means that parenting requires teamwork. And if we don't have teamwork as a parent and we work at cross purposes and we are not singing from the same hymn book and instructing our sons and daughters from the same resource, we stand the risk of losing our children to the restaurants of our day. And the restaurants of our day are actually the scavenging hills, the dung hills, or what in Ghana we call sumunasu or bolas. And our children will be eating from the, from the dung hill. May God forbid that that will happen. And it's important that as quickly as possible, husband and wife work together as a team because you never lose on a winning team and you never win on a losing team. Now, because of this, a lot of young people are outsourcing some things. And it's important we don't joke with this. They are outsourcing parenting. That is the people they submit to. for them to be nurtured and groomed. They also are sourcing mentors, those they look up to as heroes and heroines. I was in Strasbourg within our church and this was life, so I can share it. And then there was an all night. I asked the young people to write out the five role models they have. Look, this was in church. Not one mentioned an elder 
Not one mentioned a parent. Not one mentioned a pastor. Not one. I'm talking about young people in church. And so the question is, what are they seeking to become like? And that's a very important mark of mentorship. Who do they look up to as heroes and heroines? Who are the frame of reference? Who do they wish to be like? Then also the outsourcing values, the beliefs that actually regulate their behavior. So what are the belief systems that parents are putting in place? What are the belief systems that hold these young people that will regulate the behavior they have, especially in the absence of parents? Paul said to the church that you have believed whilst in my absence, but much more so do that in my absence. Then the outsourcing identity. And the identity, what they are turning out, not only what they are seeing visibly, but also what they are seeing virtually. So if you want to see how your children are turning out, who they profess to be, go to their virtual platforms. How they are projecting and portraying themselves. Then they are also outsourcing priorities, the things that mean so much to them. We as parents ought to be very careful what we make important in the eyes of our children. If you make your work more important to them than your faith, if you make life less important and money more important, that is exactly what will resonate with the child. Then more critically, morals, the outsourcing morals, what they consider as normal. And I've often said that when normal becomes boring, abnormal will become attractive. And it is at the heart of the moral culture battles of the world today. And so moving on, our forebears told us that it takes a whole village to raise a child. And indeed it is. But it has to be a wholesome village. Because if the village is not wholesome, they cannot raise a good child. I want you to see this video that happened in the wake of the pronouncement of South guilty Africa verdict Zuma on child Jacob thrown Zuma from burning in South Africa. A mother in see Durban, a mother. Eastern South Africa was forced to throw her baby from a building after it was allegedly set on fire by looters. Dozens of people in South Africa have been killed and hundreds arrested in riots following the jailing of former President Jacob Zuma last week. You see how the people stand below. The death toll in South Africa has risen to 72 to after violence the engulfed parts of the country after the jailing of former President Jacob Zuma. I this includes 10 people killed in a stampede during looting on Monday night at a shopping centre in Soweto. The BBC filmed a baby being thrown from a building you in know, Durban that was on fire after ground floor shops were looted. But the military has now been deployed to help the police the overstretch since the unrest say, began last Thursday. This child According is our to child. a police statement, a total of 1,234 people have been arrested mothering. since the unrest began because on Friday. It's really in the President Cyril Ramaphosa has called it some of, of the worst sorts. violence witnessed in South Africa since the 1990s in the big before cities, the end of apartheid, with fires set, highways blocked and business. South Africa... Now, parenting is tough. And because it is tough, it cannot be done all by the parents. I remember one time I was in South Africa for a conference and I had visited a church as guest. And after the service, the pastor told me I had to hold an emergency meeting with parents. And I asked him why. He said, well, one parent was passing by and discovered that one little boy had taken all the toilets in the rest of the um, toilet uh, rooms and then stuffed the, the tissues, all of them into one water closet and flashed it. And you know, spill over. It just spilled over the place. And one woman, elderly woman, got there and saw the boy and said to the boy, Hey, how can you do this? He said, Get off my back. Are you my mother? This is what the boy told the woman. And the woman came to the pastor to report. And the pastor had to hold a meeting with all parents of the service to tell them that every child in the church is anyone's child. Any child is everyone's child. And everyone is anyone's child. I mean, why should it take something 
as egregious as the boy did, filling the water closet with tissue paper from all the other toilets. So mothers are doing their bit. Fathers are also doing their bit. Fathers are tired, but they pretend not to be tired. They are hungry, they pretend not to be hungry. I like this video, it's one of my favorite videos from Inspired. Daddy is the sweetest daddy in the world. <laughs> daddy is the most handsome. The smartest. The most clever. The kindest. He is my Superman. Daddy wants me to do well at school. Daddy is just great, but... He lies. Listen to the things that she talks about the father faking. He lies about having a job. He lies about having money. He lies that he is not tired. He lies that he is not hungry. He lies that we have everything. He lies about his happiness. He lies because of me. Thankfully, she concludes by saying, I love you, Daddy, because she says he lies because of me. And as a father, you may not have to lie about all the things he's lying about. That's one of them. Fathers hide a lot of their pain, a lot of their fears, a lot of their anxieties. I always remark that when I came back from a trip to Kenya and my daughter, first daughter had been born, when I picked her in the swaddle cloth, you know, I had a sense of trepidation. I was just, I was, I was afraid. But I also had a sense of tranquility in my heart that she delayed a day or so before her birth, but finally she's here. But then I set myself thinking about whether or not I had what it takes to be a father. Parents are powerful. And I want us quickly to look at the power and place of what I call the peerless parent. You see, the power and place of the peerless parent is that they are present, their presence is felt, and also their absence is noticed. For those of us who are on this platform, we should strive and endeavor to be parents whose absence 
will be noticed and whose presence would also be felt. In a can, they have a statement. Anytime I hear it, I get, I cringe. To wait, when you are in it, it does not fill it up. And when you exit, it does not reduce its volume. May we, as peerless parents, understand that we have enormous power. And our place in the life of the children cannot be replaced by teachers, whether in a school, whether in a church. George Herbert says that one father is more than a thousand teachers. The English have a proverb that says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And that tells you in summary, the power of a parent. Parents, let nobody steal your power from you. The world systems and governing authorities, Bretton Woods institutions, CSOs and NGOs who have come, who are actually disempowering parents and turning themselves into surrogate parents, purporting to understand how to raise our children better than ourselves, are our biggest threat when it comes to our power and our place as parents. And we don't want to be just mere parents, casual parents, ordinary parents, mundane parents, pedestrian parents. We want to be parents who are peerless. And to be peerless parents, we need to create a home. And a home is not a building. It's an atmosphere. An atmosphere where we can engage and interact with our children, even with the digital modernism that has come, we can still engage and interact. And my wife does that very, very, very well. Very, very, very well. And you see, children will tend to gravitate towards one parent more than the other. And the one who is not feeling that way should not feel threatened. You should just work together collaboratively as parents. Because there's a house and there is a home. We sleep in a house, but live and grow up in a home. A home is where we learn 95% of the things we take into adult life. And so somebody is learning it from the street, and that is their home. It is my hope and prayer that each one of us will come to a place of understanding that the best gift we offer our child is the fidelity and friendship between us as parents. Look at the little boy. He's shocked. He's looking at his father and the mother. The interaction itself can be overwhelming for a child like this to process. But look at the piercing look he has. Sometimes it's jealousy. He feels his space is being intruded upon. But it tells us that the fidelity and friendship between husband and wife is critical, a statement we make to our child. Look at this. We need to talk. I just need to understand why you would talk to your mother like that. Dad, Drew and Tanya were sitting down watching TV, and I'm the only one mom said to go clean up. I mean, it's just not fair. You raised me to stand up for myself. So why do I get in trouble when I do it at home? Look, Chris, you might win the battle, but you're going to lose the war. Sometimes it's not about just being right. You need to apologize to your mother. I like it when the man says you need to apologize to your mother. You know, we as parents must be careful not to backstab anyone. We should not backstab each other. We must endeavor to be there for one another. Dennis Waitley talks about the greatest gift we give to our children being the roots of responsibility and the wings of independence. Our children first need to learn how to be responsible. They must learn to be responsible for their lives and the things that they do. Can I be heard, please? Uh, if somebody says they can't hear me. 
Is it okay now? Apologies. I don't yes, know. I, I, don't... I, think, I think it's okay, okay now. We need to help our children to take responsibility for themselves, for their choices, their decisions, because that will help them when they become autonomous from us. And very soon, many of our children will be autonomous. Some have already gone autonomous. And that's a gift we give them. Let us see ourselves as one day they will not be with us. And so to do that, 3 John and verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than this, to hear my children walking in the truth. That brings no greater joy than that. And as we prepare for peerless parenting, that should be our focus, that we prepare ourselves for parenting in a way that we condition our mind that our children will not live with us forever. It is so important. The next thing is this. In Psalm 1, 2, 7, 4, and 5, it says, like arrows are in the hands of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. Happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Fathers and mothers ought to be warrior parents because we need to roar like lions and lioness when we see danger coming. And we need more warrior parents because of what is happening around our world today. Some of you need to join PTA board, school board, and stuff like that, because that's where the things are being smuggled into to create all the disaffection that impacts parenting adversely. I want to pray and plead with each one of us here to be warrior parents. That's the second thing. The third one is to understand that we are handing something down to our children. And John Adams, again, says, and I quote, children learn the meaning of morality and religion and respect for law from the habitual fidelity of parents to one another. Look, the school system will do its part. The children's ministry will do their part. But more than anything, it is what you as a parent is passing to your child. I pray that our children will learn the rudiments of morality and our faith as Christians and the respect for societal norms that are sanctioned and approved and adhered to by all of us universally through our habitual dealings with one another as parents. Because parenting is more caught than taught. Look at the couple there and look at their daughter. I pray that when your child says, when I grow up, I want to be like mommy. When I grow up, I want to be like daddy. You should not panic. You should never be afraid. If your child attends church the way you do, treats the scriptures the way you do, relates with Christ the way you do, sees other human beings the way you do, interacts with his or her environment the way you do, my question is, would you be happy? If they are just like you, would you be excited or you'd be worried? If you would be worried, then there's cause for action. The final bit, what then becomes the prize and the prize of this peerless parenting? They saw Jesus walk and act in certain ways. And in Luke 11, verse 27, the fellow remarked, "Blessed is the womb that bore you and blessed are the breasts that nursed you. You see, when people see our children, they will bless us. In much the same way, when they see our children become errant and truant and become a burden to society, they will question which home they had come from, which parents raised them. May God have mercy on us. There's a price tag on every child that we see. 
and there is a prize that we shall receive. May God help us to program our children. Look at this little child who is sleeping. This is what I call parental conditioning. And Deuteronomy 6 and verse 19 says that teach them to your children. Speaking about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. But the parent can only do this when these things are in their heart and it's part of their own habits. Because the heart defines your habits. You see how the child goes sleepy as soon as he heard that particular music responded. Parents, we've got to create a conditioning for our children. Look at this boy. I love this little boy. I'm blessed. Never can be blessed. Praise the Lord. I'm blessed. Never can be blessed. Praise the Lord. I may not have. <laughs> now look at the way his eyes are dilated look at look at the piercing look that he has and the writer of proverbs says in proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 hear my son your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teachings for they are a graceful gallant for your head and pendants for your neck. When parents play the good music in the car, the child picks it along the line. They sing along and they recite it. Whether they understand it or not is not the issue. It is that out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, the Lord has ordained strength. Let us not weaken the testimony of our children by creating wrong atmosphere in our vehicles. Today, it's becoming worrying. You go to Christian function and you can't even hear a Christian song. A song that edifies and enriches. In closing, in Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is another of my favorite of children. Look at this boy. His brother is actually yawning. He pacifies him with something small. <laughs> I dare say he would have learned from his parents. And come to think of it, he's left-handed. We grew up in a culture where left-handed children were beating until they stopped. Look at the dexterity, you know. He's left-handed, but he looks like ambidextrous. See the way he's and turning the rice. I I can I cannot do it like he's doing. I will fail. I mean miserably because I look at it. And see the brother. See how he puts in the garnishing, the spices, the seasoning in proportions. He's not just more
Look at that. The brother too sleepy. He has anticipation. Yes, look at him. Look at the brother. <laughs> See how he 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 makes sure everything is gathered well in a plate. Parents, our children are watching us. See how he has allocated. Look at the brother, he's excited. See. <laughs> are you not impressed? that a little child is doing this. And God can use children to do likewise. So we have a duty as fathers and mothers, uncles and aunties, grandparents, to ensure that the perils of parenting does not become a pain in our neck. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, like Peter said, God has given us, and this is one of the favorite uh, themes that Pastor Kinsley likes because when he was Pensa coordinator, his divine power has given us all that we need for life and godliness. And may we go out of this meeting with God's divine power to overcome every peril of parenting so that we shall raise profoundly proficient and spirit propelled young people in the land that is so much in need of positive role models. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And I defer to Uncle Kobe. Uh, Kobe for questions. That's my contact on the screen. And I'll just stop screen share shortly. Thank you very much, Elder. We are so blessed, learned so much. Parents need to work together. Parents need to train up the, our children in the way they should go. And like the Bible said, when they grow, they will not depart from it. We are so grateful. Thank you for opening our eyes. And so um, if you have any questions, you can just um, send them to the chat box and I'll ask, uh, I'll read your questions for you. And uh, in the next 10 minutes, Elder would attempt or try to answer your questions. Um, I can see Elder Champon. He's saying, God richly bless you, Elder. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Um, yes, Mabel's also saying, God bless you, Elder. She came late, but... Um, she wants to bless you too, Elder. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah. So let's interact um, in the next couple of yes. minutes that we have. Yeah. Any questions for Elder? So uh, maybe I, I, I would ask this. All right. Um, Uncle Kobe. In, 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 a, in a quest to be good parents, um, how would um, a, a single parent be able to work through some of these? Um, yeah. Things? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's also one of the issues, uh, what they call soul parenting today. Now, a single parent who has the Holy Spirit in her is positioned to do all the things we have raised. Much as it is not the ideal situation for raising of children, the parents can make the best out of it by positioning themselves through the grace of God to do so. And all through scripture, you find single parents because people become single parents either as a result of widowhood or as a result of um, uh, marriage coming to an end. Uh, you know, so they become divorced or sometimes it is that 
you are raising your spouse your child alone because your spouse is away from you and momentarily you may be a single parent and so you should be able to do these things by the grace of god when you are aware that you are doing it alone and also you must understand that the children belong to our community as well and so when you're part of the household of faith they have fathers and mothers in the lord and uh, expose them to good models of parenting or friends who can impact them beyond you and uh, we know that especially when it comes to ministering to our own children it can be sometimes very difficult um, and others tend to be better positioned to minister to you, uh, your children, than yourself. I remember we had gone to hold the meeting at uh, Harvest Chapel, and then one of my colleague counselors was there. And then my older daughter said, you are going to be my counselor. <laughs> so not talking about me, you was talking about my friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you see, I mean, I, I, I thank God for that. And I, I was telling my yeah. friend, I was so happy that he chose my friend to be her counselor when she's going yeah. to get married you see so for us we should not become parents who think that i have it all i can be it all or i can do it all by myself no if you do that you'll be in some error thank you i see thank joseph's you. hand up uh, yes uh joe please go ahead and meet yourself yes, sir. thank you very much and uh, god bless you so much for amen 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 bless amen. you bless you amen. my question is that um when in life can one say i'm done with my work as a parent thank you <laughs> well i think that uh, i remember my dad once looked at me and said once you're my son now you are my brother <laughs> it didn't stop him from being my dad he was still my dad and it's it's an acknowledgement of the growth path you know we we have developmental stages that we go through at a point, the child solely depends on you for decisions, for choices, for everything. But they get to a point of autonomy where they no longer have to check things with you. They become independent, quote and unquote, as it were. Um, and then they do things all by themselves and on their own. Um, and parents should still see themselves as guardians to these persons, but they have to moderate the approach. The style has to change. Because if the style becomes like when the person was 10 years old, when they are now 30 or 40, then it becomes problematic. You become overbearing and they would want to at every material moment avoid you. So parenting is a never ending endeavor. I mean, I don't think it ends at any point. Uh, even when they are married and they are gone, they'll bring their daughters and sons to you <laughs> to, to, uh, to parent them. So as grandparents, you still be parenting. My, my, my in-laws do that. My parents did it when they were alive and they never stopped being parents. I mean, until they leave, they are still our parents. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, Steven's Stevie. hand is up. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And I go, go Richard, bless you. Uh, Dr. Stephen, your line is I, I And I wanted to discuss a bit on the children. Oh, okay. Uh, please, can you hear me? Yes, yes, now you are. Clear. Is it better now? Yes, it is. Okay, let, let me remove this. Is that, okay, please, I, I, I wanted to discuss a bit on the uh, respect of the children and phone. Yeah. Um, someone, um, we really wanted to know at four points, okay, if the child, you know, should you give your child the phone? Um, is it 14, 12 years? Because then we we had an incident where a JSS child had this thing year two, had the phone. and. It was up two o'clock, three a.m. and it just you know what's happening and all those things. So we were discussing, but but I I, I wish you would throw a bit light there and give some insight there. If where do you think is when do you think it's appropriate and you know, and how we should handle these issues um, going forward? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. If you know the way I go about my things, I am very very careful to be prescriptive. I tend to be descriptive than prescriptive in the sense that. You see, when it comes to looking at age, and if you look at it chronologically, as you have talked about 14, 13, 12, or 10, um, 
the developmental stages of individuals are not necessarily chronological. Some of it is anatomical. Others is also exposure or experiential. Now, when a child is 10 and had been properly educated on the potential or inherent dangers of using a device and it is handed to them, I don't find anything awfully bad about that. Because you could find an older person in terms of age who may not even have the set skills to manage the same device. So I'm hesitant to tell people, give it to them at age five or eight or nine or 10. Mindful of the fact that today they are learning online. So if you go and put age restrictions on the uses of devices and gadgets, you'll be biting your tongue and messing up a lot of parents. And so what we need is first and foremost to prepare our children. If you put a device in the hand of your child, i.e. a phone, a tablet, or anything, the child assumes that you have given clearance to content. That is the dangerous bit. When you buy a storybook, for instance, for your child, that, the child assumes that whatever is in the storybook, daddy or mom approves of it. So if there are some things in there that are inimical to your faith, you will notice that the child would just imbibe them hook, line, sinker. And because it is on the premise of trust that parents have good judgment. So whatever we, we are doing with our children, there are inherent dangers. And we adults know. Recently, I was sharing with a group of young people how I got a phone. Somebody gave me a gift of a phone some years back. I think it must be like five or so years back. And that phone had in it something they call Oprah, Oprah Mini as a browser. And I noticed that it was sending me notification of a teacher having sex with a student. This, this, this. And I was like, hey, why is this like that? And then my attempt to uninstall that particular Oprah Mini from the device, I got a notice that said that if you uninstall it, the device will malfunction. But I went ahead and uninstalled it. It never malfunctioned until I gave it out as a gift to someone. So this is me, an adult who is knowledgeable in this field, who has handled cases around these matters, being shown things that he does not consider appropriate. So come to think of a child or a young person who has not been given those preparations or forewarning only to find themselves in such a web, they will struggle. So everything is preparation, preparation, yeah. preparation. Adra says, how do you continue to raise morally upright children when That's one true. parent himself or herself does not act or believe in morality? That's a big headache. I don't think there are easy answers because so, see, the child is going to catch uh, uh, Please, uh, that. I'm thinking maybe our time is running out. So ah, okay. I'm thinking so, we can continue tomorrow. So that's, so this that's would... what I'll say, that this particular one is a, is a nightmarish experience, and yes. I don't wish any parents is there. Tomorrow, God willing, when I come to Kokonbembe, we'll address this. Kukunbembe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you very much, much um, <laughs> to all of you at Kokonbembe. Right. God bless. God Uncle bless Joe, God bless you. I can see you now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So, so guys, thank you so much, Elder, and um, we are so grateful to you. We've learned thank so you. much from you. And uh, I think this would even uh, tell you that you have to be in church tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. probably he, um, he would end with the priorities of peerless parenting. Yeah. Yes. And I think that everybody should be there to listen. If you can make it to church physically, I think you can join by Zoom. And so please, um, uh, our moment number has, has been shared uh, on, on, in the chat box. Please, we have a service, so you need to give us some money. <laughs> <laughs> so please... <laughs> Please, 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 you can send your offering through the uh, number shared on the screen in the chat box. Um, if I can repeat it, uh, it's 024, uh, yes, 024 That's the church's Momo number. So please, let's do well and send our offering to the Momo number. We thank you again, once again, Elder, and uh, we are very grateful. I think at this juncture, we will ask Elder, 
uh, presiding elder, Elder Joe, we'll hand over to him so that he closes us. Thank you very much. I will copy. I thought we have all agreed that our reference is anchor rather than <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who you are referring to. <laughs> yeah. he, told me, he told me to call him Kobio. <laughs> right. We thank God for a wonderful evening. And uh, we're trusting God that not only the head knowledge, but the spirit behind the word will enter our hearts and transform Amen. our parenting Amen. activities. Amen. Um, uh, honestly, I, I, I'm going to add my voice. Let us do well and encourage as many as possible to join tomorrow at the dome. And uh, we will all be blessed. We thank God. We thank God for this. Let us pray and uh, talk to our Father on this. Daddy, we are grateful unto you for an opportunity like this. It is your spirit that moves through your word to affect our lives, to transform us progressively to become like Jesus. As we speak about parenting, there is no greater parent than you. As we become more and more like you, even in our walk through the word, let the truth of your word come alive in us. May the children around us know that you are the God of our lives. May they see more of you in us, and may they have their lives affected by you. And may we show much love, much love in wisdom and in discipline to our children. May we become good stewards of the gifts of children that you have granted unto us, that the generations after us will call our generations blessed because of the good things you have worked through us. Father, we pray, O oh God, and even present parents marriages and children and families before you this evening. Father, oh God, as we have learned of these things that are necessary for our successful life in family, we pray that you grant the grace, you grant the grace, you grant the grace. Let grace abound to us so much that the difficulties we encounter and even the limitations in our humanity will give way for the preeminence of your spirit that operates in us. We thank you that you are a loving God and you change us and then make us enjoy our lives in families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. All right, so we're going to meet tomorrow. And uh, I think at this juncture, we'll just share the grace together. Uh, as many as can show their faces. If you can show your face, we'll be, ha we'll be happy to see your face. If you can't, no worries. Uh, so let us all share the grace together. May the grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 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 and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. And forevermore. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Oh, God bless you all. Oh, we'll see you tomorrow. You see you. See you. God bless. Wow. Have a good night. Good Bishop. night. Yes, sir. God bless you all. Bless you too. Uh, we'll, we'll talk backstage in the morning. What's your All right. Bless oh, you, sir. Thank you. Shalom. 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 Yo, peace. There is a name, there is a name that counts the seas and stains the storm. Ah, I know a name, I know a name that changes lives and destinies. The wind of bay and demons flee. When that name is lifted high, say a oh